are you doing? I am so glad. I always say, how are you doing? I don't give you time to answer, I'm sorry. Uh, I am so glad you're here today as we continue our study on the end times. Uh, but before we get into that, you might want to turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll start there and then get back over to Mark chapter 13. But I just want to show you this behind me here. This is my pride and joy. Uh, one of the sweet, sweet gals at our church uh, started there when we first started. She was just a baby at the time, of course. Denise Sobel, and, and she does these kinds of things, artistic works and so forth. So this is a, a rug or a carpet or a tapestry or a blanket or whatever. They told me to put it on my bed when they gave it to me. I said, that's not going to my bed. It's going to hang on the wall. So I hung that on the wall here in, in the dining room. And it's just uh, what it is when, when, when Wanda passed away, Denise asked if she could have her clothes, any clothes that we would give her. And so we, we gave her Wanda's clothes and everything on that is something that Wanda wore, whether it was a blouse or a dress or pants or jacket or, or whatever, uh, you know, uh, and it's just, I, I, I look at it at times and I, oh yeah, I look at a certain picture, oh yeah, I remember when I bought that for her and she, she did wear that, she liked that when I gave it to her and, and all of these things and it's just, you can see on there it says, on this side of the first finger on this side it says, my Sammy, what does that mean? Well. Uh, those who knew us well knew that that's, I always called Wanda Sammy. Uh, from the first time we met, I renamed her Sammy. I have no idea why. I think there's a story, but I, I don't think I want to bring it up. But um, she enjoyed the name and I did. And so she was my Sammy. And I called her that uh, all, all of her life. The other side says my bride. In the middle there is a picture of a uh, Can-Am spider. Well, Can-Am spiders came out in 2008. Um, they're a trike, and um, I went and looked at them, and uh, when got one, and I said, I know you never wanted me to get a motorcycle, um, but look at this, man. Took her for a ride on it, and uh, she said, okay, the kids are all gone, and <laughs> you'll be careful, because I'll be with you all the time. And we bought it in 2008 when it first came out, still have it. We rode it a lot, rode it in groups, rode it by ourselves, made long trips. She absolutely loved it. She uh, loved the air in her face. And I think she just loved being with me and I loved being with her. And we just had a great time. So that's what that's all about. And so um, that's gonna be with me. That's gonna, when I'm doing these uh, bridge connections, she's gonna be here, right beside me or right behind me, right, right there with me. In this study, you know, in the end times, I mentioned yesterday that I, I used a, a plethora of um, of help of of people that I read a lot of books, used a lot of commentaries. I probably have uh, well with the internet and stuff. I had probably ten or fifteen commentaries that I go to that way. Besides my own personal commentaries, um, and you're you're reading those, you're reading books, and I uh, learned so much from Pastor Chuck Smith, my pastor, and his writings on on uh, end times were just really what sparked me to, to even become a, a pastor at this time, at that time. And uh, I also got some stuff from um, Dave Guzik, a friend of mine in The Enduring Word you can find on the internet. John Wolverd has written some great stuff uh, about the rapture in the end times. Uh, Stephen Armstrong, director of Verse by Verse Ministry International. That might be a site you want to go to, some very interesting teachings there. Uh, Moody Bible Institute. Got some stuff from them. Gotquestions.org. I'm telling you, if you have questions about anything, go to gotquestions.org and it'll, it'll get answered. Charlie Campbell, always be ready. Uh, his website. As soon as we get back in church, he's going to be one of the first guys I can get over to, to get, get in the church to, to uh, talk to all of us about it. And, and then I'll, I'll also uh, John Corson, who uh, has written some great things in his, in his commentary. You can get his commentary. It's a practical commentary and it is... Uh, very, very good if you don't have that. Uh, it has one of the New Testament, one of the Old Testament, and it's explained very simply, and uh, but very deeply at the same time. So if you don't have a, something like that, you might want to pick that up, or you can get it online, I think. Um, Paul has a, wrote a passage in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 
where he explains some of these, explains some of the, some of the intricate details of events that end this age. And I wanted to call your attention to how Paul um, begins this passage and then how he ends it. He begins it, verse 1, well, not verse 1, verse 13, the passage we want. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Paul begins this section saying that he didn't want believers to be, to remain ignorant of the events of, of the end of the times so they wouldn't lose hope. Okay, he says if you, if you lose your concept of the end times, you're going to lose hope. He goes on to explain the events surrounding the Lord's return for the church. And what is this, what, what, what is this hope that Paul doesn't want us to lose? Well, it's the hope of our resurrection into a new eternal body and a glorious, glorious eternal future. Oh man, I grab onto that hope. I don't want to forget that, man. When you're living in this world and experiencing the trials and, and the difficulties, it can be really difficult to keep your mind on eternal things. It is so easy, you know, to be distracted, become preoccupied with earthly concerns. Where am I going to live? What am I going to do? How's this relationship going to go any further? Is my business going to remain? Am I going to have a job? I, I don't know how I'm going to take care of my kids. School doesn't open. We have to work. All of these things. But when we do that, we begin to lose our Christian hope. And we start to live just like the world around us. And the world around us has no hope. And Paul says the antidote to that problem is to learn more about what the future is that is waiting for us, not less. That's why we study chapters like Mark 13. To remind ourselves of the glorious future. Did you hear me? The glorious future the Lord has for us. Furthermore, the scripture says, we must make it our ambition to live out our hope in front of the world. That's our job. That's our responsibility. The Christian hope is in knowing that we have been saved from the penalty of death and we need to be living that in front of everybody. We have nothing to fear from the end of our lives or from the calamities of, of earthly life. And demonstrating that confidence requires understanding. Why? Because it's true. It's true. Finally, here Paul ends this passage with a second statement about hope. Verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul had just finished explaining the circumstances surrounding the Lord's appearing and the resurrection of the church. And then he says the church is to take these teachings and the church is to pass them around and the church is to share them with one another. And we are to do this so that we comfort, so that we comfort one another. How did Paul expect his teaching on the end times would comfort us? He knew that the better we understood the future, the more we would look forward to it. And the more we look forward to the future, the more we'll prepare our hearts to please Jesus so we will be ready to meet him. <laughs> and maybe best of all, we will be united with our brothers and sisters in our, in our understanding of the Bible and of our future. And I, I just watched today and it's probably as bad as I've ever seen it. Even so many Christians are so uptight about um, the condition of our nation, the, the culture that we're living in, it, it's turned upside down. I know that. It's so radical. It's so changed. It's in just a few weeks or a few months. And it's, it's amazing. And, and then I, I talk to people and they say, boy, we got we to gotta win this election, whichever side you're on. 
and you're afraid if you don't, if you're on this side, if we don't win, it's going to go as we're, we're going to be through. It doesn't go this way. Oh man, it's going to be destroyed. You know what? Our future is not in who's elected. Oh, I have an opinion and I'll vote. But um, because the Bible tells me to, and I would love to see my candidate win, but my future is not there. I'm not going to uh, panic and, and be sorrowful for days or anything because my future is in the truth of the, of the end times. And if God's preparing all of this for the end times, then I'm okay with that too. So as we study the end times, we'll find our hope in the future growing and growing and our concerns over what trouble us, troubles us fading and fading. I love that. So all of a sudden you're studying it, you're thinking about it, you're not thinking about the worldly things. And I can't think of a better time in recent memory when the church needed an eternal perspective. Our study through this chapter is going to stir us I hope to obey Jesus and to walk in, in, in his direction for us. Because it's going to give us what we most need to motivate ourselves, motivate ourselves to obey. And that's hope. We have hope. This is not all there is that I can obey. Mark chapter 13. How come we haven't been there yet? Been slow this morning. Verse 5. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed. That no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and he and will deceive many. History shows that uh, in the first 100 years after Jesus spoke these words, no less than 64 men came on the scene claiming to be the Messiah. And we see a continuance of this today by those who, who propagate the old age or new age lie, whatever it is, probably both. And we all have a this God consciousness. We're built with this God consciousness within us. And we are all, therefore, deity. We're all gods. The first thing that Jesus warned against were deceivers. It's interesting how that all the way through the New Testament, the church was warned over and over and over of deceivers false prophets. It's been the curse of the church. Men who have sought to profit off the gospel of Jesus Christ, sought personal profit and gain. There are so many charlatans, wolves in sheep clothing. And Jesus warns them against these deceivers. So he warns of the danger of false messiahs who come in his name. They'll pretend to be Jesus or at least representatives of Jesus but they will not be his true representatives. So Jesus' first warning is that no one in the church should be misled into believing that Jesus has already come. So don't believe that. Jesus has not come yet. It's one of the constants of his, of this age that people are always guessing the end wrongly. They're assuming, they are assuming that minor things are signs of the end, but they are nothing. We're going to see that as we go through this. Verse 7, when you hear wars and rumors of wars, that'd be trouble, for such things must happen. But the end is not yet. So now we see the second sign that he gives. We shouldn't be worried over. The second thing we shouldn't be worried over is wars and rumors of wars. In our world, war will be constant along with rumors of wars, but war is not a sign of anything by itself. When you hear about world powers threatening each other, it's meaningless. These things happen merely because we live in a world of sin. So these things are not signs of the end. He just said that. So you can have wars, rumors of wars, but these are not a sign of the ends. So I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm just telling you what the Bible said. Mark 13, 8, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places. We're in verse eight. And there will be famines and troubles. 
These are the beginnings of sorrows or birth pains. Now he lists some other things and he says, these are the beginnings. The signs of the end of the age will act like birth pangs. So we should understand a little bit how birth pangs work if we are to appreciate how these signs will work. First, we know that birth pangs are painful. I was one of these guys that in my age, they wouldn't let me in the room with, with Wanda for any of our daughters. Um, I had to sit on the outside in the father's room and take a nap or whatever, and she's in there in this excruciating pain. But believe me, I, I heard about it for all my life, I think. But we know that first of all, birth pangs are painful. They are intensely painful. They're contractions that interrupt normal life for the woman and announce something new is about to to arrive. So are the signs of the end of the age. They will be painful experiences for the world and they will interrupt normal life in every imaginable way. But they announce something new and they announce something better that's going to arrive. Secondly, we know that birth pangs can start very mildly, mildly, even imperceptibly. Some women can think that their birth pangs aren't real at first, so it'll be the signs, so it will be with the signs of the end of the age. They will start mildly, and many will not notice or recognize the significance of them. And thirdly, we, we know that birth pangs increase in severity as time progresses. The contractions get stronger and stronger, so it will be with the signs of the end of the age. going to repeat themselves over and over. But as they repeat, they will get stronger and the more severe and the more damage will become. Fourthly, birth pangs increase in frequency. That is, they get closer together. So we know how far apart they are and how long they last when someone's going through this. The closer together the contractions, the closer the woman is to the end, so it will be with the signs also, as they repeat closer and closer together. And that increasing frequency is a, a sign that the end is approaching. So that's the comparison that Jesus offers for the signs of the end of the age. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna. I think we're going to put a, put a little comma there because uh, I want to get into the signs that Jesus is going to use now for the end of the age. And uh, finally, these signs open, ultimately lead to the birth of a new life. And uh, that's, when, that's where we are headed in these signs. And the, the pains on the earth increase as the end approaches. So does Christ's return and the start of a brand new kingdom that he's ruler and reigner of, ruler, and, and, and we're going to be in that kingdom. At that point, a new world and a new life for Israel and for everybody, for all believers, new life will begin. So that's the comparison that Jesus offers for the signs of the end of the age and now, tomorrow we will look at the specific signs. Beginning with, go back to verse eight that we just read. Um, and we'll look at the, the specific signs. And as they build, we're to understand these things um, are signs that it's gonna get, it gets more frequent. His return is, is so much nearer. So we'll pick that up there. Okay, let's pray with me. 
<clears throat> Father, I thank you for this time together today. I, Lord, I ask that you would just open our ears, unplug them, uh, scales from our eyes. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Lord, so much of the church, us, have become kind of um, really involved in the world, Lord. Maybe we haven't done sinful things, but we're, 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 we're not giving all our energy to you and to our relationship with you and the things of your kingdom. We're working so diligently in the world and the world's going to be over. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for you is going to last, Lord. So God, help us to, your word show us. The last couple of teachings and the next couple of teachings, Lord, that your word would show us in such a way that there would be an excitement about your soon return, Jesus. Because you are coming soon. We believe that with our whole heart. And Lord, I know the enemy wants to keep us blinded. I know the world wants to keep us, you know, tied up in, in the things of life instead of totally surrendered to our Lord and Savior. Lord, let us see you again. And what it cost you to die for us. Give us a fresh <clears throat> vision of grace, of mercy, and what it cost you to give that to us. So this kingdom we're talking about, this, this eternal life, this hope that we have as believers is all because of what you did for us. Forgive us for taking so much for granted. Lord, help us to turn our eyes back upon you and away from the world. We'll do what we have to do. But we want to be in the world and not of it. We want to be in it in such a way that we are living a life of hope. And our lives would reveal to others around us that you are real and you died for them. And you want them in your kingdom for eternity. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. See you tomorrow.